Um, okay, nice to see you all this morning. Um, how many here uh, were mining Bitcoin in 2009? Okay, great. Uh, why aren't you on a beach somewhere? I'm just kidding. Um, no, like most of us, I think, uh, this Bitcoin phenomenon has come across with some degree of, uh, we're not quite sure what to make of it, right? Because on one hand, it seems like there's this amazing world of decentralized, dis distributed applications that are possible with, with this new technology. Uh, and on the other hand, it feels like not only uh, a, a currency speculation kind of thing, uh, uh, it might also be the, the, the actual heat death of the universe if we all have to mine in order to just pay rent, right? Uh, run all these giant mining rigs. Um, but what has surfaced out is that uh, uh, if people have started to focus on an underlying technology within Bitcoin, within other coins, Ethereum, that sort of thing, and that's something called the blockchain. And the blockchain is actually not a dramatically new idea. Uh, in a sense, it's a decentralized database, right? Uh, a decentralized database that is, uh, uh, has multi-masters, right? Anybody can write to it. It's a ledger, uh, and uh, it's resilient to hostile actors. Somebody could try to corrupt uh, the consensus forming process of what's the next entry to write into the ledger, and the rest of the network would be able to recognize that and stop it. Um, and this decentralized ledger is uh, something that used to be core to, to thinking about how we might scale up database systems. And then we figured out how to make the central uh, single master kind of model work and scale up to you know, internet scale, and then we forgot about it. Until Satoshi, until Bitcoin reintroduced this idea by helping us realize these different masters in this database could actually represent different actors, different organizations, different individuals, uh, perhaps even anonymously, right? So Satoshi took this like whole series of different ideas, including blockchain and, and uh, uh, the you know this kind of uh, decentralized database idea, uh, and created a currency out of it. But in doing that, he kind of highlighted the potential to come back to this idea of distributed ledgers uh, as this really interesting technology. Now, what might you also use that for? Um, well, the distributed ledger that keeps track of, uh, uh, that is essentially the system of record, right? The source of truth in a community of participants. Um, you could use that as a way to build an immediate settlement network for a bank, right? Uh, where 20 banks might be writing into this ledger, uh, such and such traded with such and such, whatever, and then be able to go back and prove that actually all happened in sequence uh, and not be able to refute that certain things happened as well. Um, you could also use it to implement a land title registry database for a government that people might otherwise worry would be corrupt and be tempted to go back and change the entries in the land title registry. By building it as a blockchain, you build it publicly, you build it visibly. So, so there's been this emerging recognition of the importance of this underlying technology, and plenty of books written about it. You don't need me to proselytize about it. Um, but one of the important things has been this realization that there are other ways to get to a distributed ledger and to the world of smart contracts built on top of that than proof of work. Proof of work is the consensus mechanism used in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, in these other technologies to decide what's the next link in the chain, right? Uh, and it basically runs a massive lottery <laughs> by asking everybody to reverse a SHA-256 uh, signature to uh, figure out who wins the right to write the next block, right? Um, and this is not only incredibly inefficient, it's very... It's just not appropriate when you're not dealing with an anonymous network the way that the currencies are. If you're dealing instead with a set of known actors, those 20 banks I talked about, or uh, the government that I mentioned, but with a bunch of auditing agencies and you know, uh, private sector and, uh, and other nonprofit groups kind of watching, right? Um, all of this can happen in a setting where you can use a, a simpler consensus mechanism, something more quorum-based, such as you know, the majority of people agree this is the next link in the chain, so let's go forward, right? Um, uh, and it's also, people started to realize, well, is, is Bitcoin gonna be like TCP IP? 
right, where there is, really is only room for one, and eventually people will just switch because it's lowest friction to, to all use the same uh, low-level networking protocol, so why not use the same low-level uh, uh, payments protocol, right, or the same low-level uh, uh, blockchain protocol? The reality, as we've seen, is that there's not only a need uh, and, and, a, and a role, and, and, and this probably won't end, for multiple public chains, um, such as those coins that you know that you all see and know about. Some of them actually special purpose, like Namecoin, which is a, a DNS-oriented thing. Um, but room for millions and millions of private chains as well. Right? Essentially, any time you have a group of companies or governments or institutions, whatever, that all want to maintain a common ledger, that's essentially a shared database. And databases don't act like networks. Right? That's that's probably the realization people are moving to. So. So this, so this all created this, this sense in, at the end of last year that there might be a need for something different to where the, the, the Bitcoin and Ethereum communities were heading. Right? Something else that created a sense for a need for something different was you know, one thing that we've had in the history of uh, uh, internet technologies and standards has been uh, a separation of concern uh, between three different kinds of organizations. And it don't, doesn't always start this way, but it tends to evolve this way. Um, and those three are the standards bodies, the, the implementers, and the global policy organizations, right? So take DNS, for example. DNS started uh, very, very, uh, uh, very much amongst a small group of developers trying to replace Etsy hosts with something a little bit more decentralized, right? Um, uh, and it evolved to people who wrote the, web, wrote the DNS servers, people like Paul Vixie and Dan Bernstein, uh, to the standards uh, set at places like the Internet Engineering Task Force and the policy organizations like ICANN. And it's always been very beneficial, you know, from, from the, like, in, in the web server technology space, for example, to say at, at Apache, it was useful to be able to push certain debates and certain issues over to the IETF and say either it's already been solved over there or if you have an issue, take it over there, right? Um, and, and, you know, the W3C is kind of halfway between policy and, and standards, but, but basically organizations tend to fan out amongst these three. And the challenge with a technology project that's focused on a currency is that it's really hard to tease out the three separate kind of angles to this, right? Uh, because simultaneously, you have to bootstrap and build in all three, and you have some communities who are very firm that the code is the standard, right? Um, and that can make it really hard to try to track it, but also make it hard to try to separate out the technology debates from the coin debates. And you know, like the normal passion that we see on an open source developer mailing list, well, multiply that by uh, having tokens in your pocket that uh, uh, the values of which uh, are impacted by the outcome of that debate, right? That's, that's what makes for some of the, the very challenging environments that we have out there in the open source world around blockchain technology. Um, finally, there's this kind of recognition that, you know, this is a hard uh, set of, of challenges. There's, you know, if you look at something like the, the DAO hack, how many people here know what I'm talking about, the DAO? Okay. Um, not, it, definitely Google it. Um, it's, uh, but it was an example where people tried to build a smart contract on Ethereum that was very ambitious, very, uh, 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 very much about trying to decentralize the world of venture capital, which looked really cool. $150 million worth of Ethereum went into it, and uh, it led to uh, not only about three months of Sturm and Drang in the Ethereum community, but now a fork between two different Ethereum tokens, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, right? Um, a very challenging situation for that community that is actually creating tremendously cool code, but, but still hobbled by many of these challenges. Right, um, and, and it's because we're still very early on in a lot of this. There's still a lot of good work to do in consensus mechanisms, in how to write smart contracts, and how to build these tools. And the answer doesn't seem to be in, in one Teutonic, you know, here is the answer, here is the single platform. But in a, a sort of decentralized collaborative um, ecosystem, 
where uh, uh, people feel much more, much less tribal about uh, uh, you know where their development is going on and 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 who's a part of which release mainstream, um, where uh, uh, things uh, people perhaps can share code more willingly or allow their own experiments to die more willingly, um, and perhaps be able to be innovative in a way that doesn't have them worrying about you know uh, replacing the engine on a 747 mid-flight which is how much of, the, much of the debate can feel sometimes in these communities. Um, I'll also pipe in, there are a bunch of people who've been concerned about code provenance, right? So look, thinking back on, on Apache, for example, uh, we were very clear from pretty much the, the formation of the Apache Software Foundation that one of the things we need, needed to be able to guarantee to companies and individuals using Apache software was that they were getting their code from the developers who had all the rights to make those contributions, that they knew uh, where it came from, they were attesting to it, and you were getting it with all the patent rights included as well, and a really important part of the Apache license, right? So when an enterprise pulled down Apache FUBAR, Apache, you know, anything, they would know that it was, you know, they didn't have to worry about waking up to a submarine patent issue later on or, you know, having to suddenly find an alternative. And that wasn't something that yet had existed in this space. So this is, the need, this is what drove the need for the development of something new. Um, a set of organizations started to um, place calls to Jim. Um, uh, he started to, to host some conference calls, some face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and those companies included uh, very familiar names like IBM and Intel. They included some, some brand new types of uh, companies, such as uh, Digital Asset Holdings and R3. Um, and included some companies that had never previously engaged with the Linux Foundation before, such as J.P. Morgan Bank, right? Um, and after a bunch of conversation, they said, well, let's, let's get this thing going with, um, under the, the framework of the Linux Foundation's collaborative projects framework, right? Um, uh, a, a framing that has now been successfully used in 25, 30 different projects, and uh, I'm, uh, I, I, it's growing all the time, actually. Um, uh, and this is a framework that allows for companies that identify, uh, you know, a, a, a niche that needs a, an open source solution uh, and a, a set of technology projects. Maybe they exist. Maybe they need to exist. And, and an emerging uh, pool of developers interested in tackling that from those companies, but also potentially beyond those companies as well, to come together and build, build technology. And, and so Hyperledger was launched in December. The first code release happened in February. Um, and that code was called Fabric, um, Hyperledger Fabric. Hyperledger Fabric is a uh, code that initially started at IBM uh, I, I, uh, for about uh, two years built internally as Open Blockchain and now released as Fabric. Um, it's uh, now under active development uh, uh, publicly. Uh, first at GitHub, now we move to, to the Linux Foundation's Garrett instance. And Fabric is an implementation of this kind of private blockchain model where if you have a set of known named entities, 20 banks or a government and a regulatory agency and NGOs and others, who all want simply a shared distributed ledger and want to label, be able to layer on top of that a smart contract platform. Um, in this case, smart contracts written in Go, although there's experimental support for Java as well uh, as for Ethereum's virtual machine. Um, and this, this platform can be used to build such a, such a system. Uh, it is still pre-1.0, uh, pre-beta even, um, but today you can uh, go to hyperledger.org, find Fabric, pull down the developer environment, and, and have, uh, you know, if you're familiar with tools like Docker and Vagrant, have a four-node uh, uh, blockchain, private blockchain running within, within about an hour of pulling down the development tools. Getting the Go tools up and running uh, is probably the biggest, biggest part of that. Um, uh, and it's still under active development. It's still something that uh, 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 is, uh, you know, in terms of transaction rate, you know, that sort of thing, is uh, uh, still still being worked on. Uh, but it's 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 the basis for what we hope will be actually a series of projects at uh, Hyperledger. There are a couple of others as well. There's one called Sawtooth Lake, which is a project that Intel brought over that implements something a different consensus mechanism called proof of elapsed time. 
uh, which is kind of an alternative to proof of work using some uh, in instructions inside of Intel's SGX extensions, which uh, uh, looks pretty interesting. Uh, and we're opening the door now to other projects. There's a graphical explorer for blockchains ca uh, called Hyperledger Explorer that was just launched, a bunch of SDKs, that sort of thing. Um, so the project has grown. We've got uh, uh, a couple of uh, hundred developers on our different mailing lists. We've got thousands of people who've engaged on Slack. Uh, we have uh, uh, 140 people we've identified as contributors who are now voting in something called uh, the, the, the Technical Steering Committee election. Uh, uh, and this, this Technical Steering Committee are the group of about 11 core devs who are, look over the kind of the technical direction for the project. Uh, and that's something that we bootstrapped with a set of 11 from the companies that came together. Uh, but now we feel that a meritocratic process needs to actually establish who they are and, uh, 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 and, and that kind of relationship to the rest of the community. Um, uh, we're still very much a work in progress when it comes to the developer tooling and the documentation and all that sort of thing. But uh, uh, we're starting to make some waves out there. Uh, and the uh, sponsoring membership has grown as well. Initially when it launched, there were about 20, 20 sponsors who said, let's come together to get this kicked off. There are now 80 different uh, sponsoring members, everyone from companies like Airbus, who uh, are, is looking at using uh, blockchain technologies to implement uh, a, a transparency layer for their supply chain, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, to a small Chinese startup company called Orange Magic Cube, who uh, I'm still working to figure out exactly what their use for blockchain will be. Um, but uh, uh, they uh, um, actually, 15 of our 80 members are from China. I was there uh, two months ago. I'll be there again next month. Um, the level of interest and, uh, uh, and genuine interest, developer interest in China and in blockchain technologies, not just in Bitcoin, which we all know about already, but actually in blockchain technologies is tremendous. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to trying to actually build a global developer community um, around, around the different Hyperledger projects. Um, but in, in the development of this, you know, we're taking inspiration from the Linux Foundation's collaborative projects uh, framework, but I'm also really taking inspiration from what we did with Apache. Uh, and I'll do a shout out to, to Cliff Skolnick, who's here. Uh, I don't know if he's actually in the room. He was sitting towards the back. Um, uh, uh, he's actually helping run infrastructure for the conference. Um, Cliff was a co-founder not only of a company that together with me in 93, but uh, one of the earliest uh, co-founders of the Apache project, the web server project, when it spun out from, when we spun it out from NCSA. Uh, and then uh, Ross Gardner uh, uh, might be here as well, I, I heard, uh, who's the president of the ASF. And so uh, I, at Apache, what we really figured out was that the code, not that it doesn't matter, it certainly matters, and it certainly has to be category leading, but what matters first is building a healthy software developer community, right? that uh, uh, if you build a good community, one that the, where the development practices are all public, where the issues are public, where the roadmap is public, where the conversations, most importantly, are public, uh, then good software emerges as a natural byproduct. Right? Um, and that community dynamic is something that some communities take for granted. It's something that the Linux kernel mailing list has always had in spades, right? Um, other communities, uh, uh, people who start those projects, that, that's second nature to them. It's like a fish taking to water. Um, but most of the companies that we're working with are companies that have previously, previously never really engaged with open, with open source, right? A company like JP Morgan Bank has certainly ingested a lot of open source before, and they've worked with companies like Red Hat and, and others to, to push you know, any changes they might have need back upstream. But this is the first time that, that a company like that, a bank, is saying, no, this is a core technology for us, and we have our own devs helping push the platform forward. We don't just want to be a consumer way outside here. So help us understand how to make that work. And that's the biggest challenge, is taking developers whose previous you know, collaboration experience was sitting in the same room and uh, having a whiteboard and bringing them to how open source communities work, how to use an issue tracker, a public uh, repository, how to use Git. I mean, not mechanically how to use Git, 
but how to really use Git and Garrett and, and those for, for a real public workflow for the development process. That's the thing that we have to get right. That's our biggest challenge. Um, and that's, but I think if we do that, we build scale, where we build not only an awesome fabric, but we build potentially a series of technology projects that, uh, that become category leading. Um, and then wrapping back to, to these other, uh, uh, other communities. Uh, so I think over the long term, projects like Bitcoin, projects like Ethereum come to be seen as standards and global policy kinds of uh, uh, plays, kinds of organizations, right? Um, and if you remember that kind of three-way kind of branch, um, there's uh, no reason why down the road uh, we couldn't see projects at Hyperledger, for example, that implement those standards or that could participate on those networks, right? Um, and and those, those types of projects, you know, would be welcome today uh, uh, to go through our, our project proposal and incubation process. And so um, uh, that, that, to me, speaks to a future for Hyperledger that's actually pretty broad. So... Uh, with that, I just wanted to say thanks to the Linux Foundation for hosting this project. Thanks to you all for listening to me. And uh, I'm, I'm really jazzed. I hope you guys w uh, uh, take a look at the project. Thanks. Come on, you with me for a second. Okay. So, so I'm the one that talked, I talked you out of a life uh, as an investor. Uh, to come Thank back, you, by the way, <laughs> that was back less, from, less sexy than it back sounds. from the other side. Yeah, uh, but uh, you, you know, when you and I first started discussing this project, and we've been looking at this blockchain space for a while, you know, one of the things that I think this audience should get a sense of is the dizzying impact of this technology because it is a somewhat complicated topic, and uh, you can describe the dizzying array of smart contracts, uh, supply chain management applications, you know, tracking conflict diamonds was something we right. heard about yesterday. Uh, but let, let's just, to give everyone a sense of the impact here, describe a little bit about just in the financial services industry. The back office today taxes the financial services industry. The back office means you can do a nanosecond high frequency trade, but it takes you a week to actually get your money. The back office is the week it takes to You're get your money. You're telling me to make the back office sexy the for back, a room full of make the back office. It's an $80 billion okay. impact. Let me try to do it really quick. In 2008, when the uh, home mortgage and real estate kind of market you know, disaster unfolded. The biggest reason for that panic uh, selling was the fact that uh, you had companies selling tranches of risk in mortgages, which meant that somebody's mortgage might actually be owned by 100 different banks. Right, if their mortgage had been sliced and diced by, by many of the operations. And, and the problem was, as things started to fall apart, no one could find the paperwork. And when no one can find the paperwork on your house, you can't sell it, or if you can, you have to sell it for pennies on the dollar, right? Like, like this became a real nuts and bolts, real asset emergency. And part of that was because there wasn't a way to quickly look this up. There wasn't a record of these transactions that could independently be, be gone through. And I'm not saying blockchain would have solved that because there could have been bad applications or incomplete applications. Sure. But uh, many people say that, that this is the kind of technology that could try to help keep the, the next major disaster like that from being about you know, uh, a paperwork disaster, right? right? Uh, to try to routinize and automate more of the systems of the world so that they become more transparent and hopefully more accountable to us. I'm personally really engaged by uh, the idea of this as an anti-corruption tool, right? Um, but it, at the same time, if we can get it as an efficiency tool, as a, uh, a way to make the systems of the world run better, faster, um, then it seems like all sides win. Yeah, I mean, one use case, $80 billion impact just on the back office of the financial industry. But I remember what I ta the way I talked you into this was, Let's go change the nature of trust on the internet. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with blockchain, really that is an ambition that this project has. This is one of the fastest growing projects I've ever witnessed in terms of developer momentum, in terms of organizations. So if you're not familiar with blockchain or Hyperledger, go check it out. Thanks, Brian, for coming Thanks. today.